Hey everyone, Brian Von Vier here. We've all finished a campaign. We've all finished something. And there's not always been something satisfying waiting for us. But today we're going to be talking about the opposite. DMs and players. What are the most satisfying ends to a final boss fight you've had in a campaign? That would be Xenoball in our monstrous Eberron campaign. A little word of introduction to understand why Xenoball became the big bad evil guy to end all big bad evil guys for our group. A preface must be made around the draconic prophecy. See, in the Eberron campaign setting, there is a mysterious force that manifests itself through markings and complex hieroglyphs, the draconic prophecy. A mysterious form of writing that can be read in draconic and seems to give insight on the future for those who can translate its cryptic messages. The prophecy would manifest in any and every form, most notably the naturally appearing tattoos of the dragon-marked houses, but also in scripts, in star alignments, in wind charts, geographical formations, and oceanic streams. Only one creature in all of Eberron could say to have an extensive knowledge of the draconic prophecy, Xenobal, the prophecy incarnate. See, this silver dragon was born under a particular planetary alignment that coincided with a verse of the prophecy. And since its very first days, he started studying it. Now a great worm and a semi-divine figure between the dragons of Eberron, Xenobal had occurred so much knowledge about the prophecy that it actually defied reason itself. His entire life seemed to rush towards a focal event, the foreseen severance, where Xenobal would finally make sense of the entire prophecy and rescind his mortality, rising to quasi-divinity by becoming one and the same with the prophecy. He could bend fate around the mortals of Eberron so as to obtain a perfect future, where everybody would have the best possible life for them, but where mortals could not oppose themselves to fate. He was so obsessed to become the one with the draconic prophecy that he etched verses and segments of it into his own scales, searing his own flesh with intricate markings and etching runes into his very soul. And you know what? He succeeded in the end. Our group of monstrous adventurers, a succubus rogue, a bugbear fighter, a mind flayer sorcerer, a yonti half-blood ranger, and a lizard folk druid was too late in their efforts and they managed to start their fight with Xenoball right as the foreseen severance was taking effect. The world crumbled around us, and we had to fight the Silver Great Worm into a strange place called the Event Horizon. If you can imagine a serene, mirror-like lake at sunset, but extending as far as the eye can see, then you have a very rough idea of the place where the adventurers of the Hand held their last stand against Xenoball. It was clear from the start, this battle is going to be a brutal massacre, and Xenoball is the one dealing the hatchet chops. After a fight chock full of epic spells and meteor swarms, it becomes clear that we cannot win this battle. There is only one epic spell remaining in our sorcerer's inventory, an epic seed of rewind. Using that seed to cast an epic spell takes 60 rounds but the group endures it to the very last. First, we lose Aspheria, the rogue to a meteor swarm. Our group has become a quartet. Then we lose Zul the fighter, as he dies by Xenobal's hand. Well, it's a trio now. Then my PC, Shalaka the ranger, dies to an epic spell. It's a duet now. 60 turns have passed, and Cyrezen the sorcerer casts his epic rewind spell. Now, he could have sent time back to the start of the fight, resetting the encounter and avoiding our deaths, but no, oh no, he creates a solution that solves not only the fight, but the very source of all the suffering that would have befallen Eberron. He rewinds Xenoball. The focused epic spell is of monstrous proportions, and Xerazen combusts for the magical backlash that racks his body as he launches his last spell. Well, it's a solo act now. Zolith the Red, the lizard folk druid, just waits. Xenobal doesn't understand at first, but soon he starts shrinking. Well, no, not shrinking, regressing. 
his traits become less wizened, acquiring on a younger appearance as he goes from great worm to mature to adult to young dragon. Mewling incoherently, Xenoball crawls into a fetal position, and then he becomes an egg. Zolith, the red, slowly marches toward the newly formed egg and cradles it in a serene way. Through this campaign, Zolth the Red has journeyed from being an ineffective pragmatist to a loyal friend and a father figure inside the group. He cries for his lost comrades, but also understands the task he has to undergo now. Some of Xenobal's enslaved Jinns come asking if the Master freed them, now that the dominate monster cast on them has been severed. Zolith watches the egg as Xenobal is born again under no planetary alignment. This time, but after the resolution of the foreseen severance, his scales pearly white, pure, made anew. The wormling looks at Zolith with no malice in his eyes this time, just a tinge of curiosity. Zolith smiles and then speaks, My friends, now we are all free. Oh, dude, that actually made me cry. That was the best ending to a there's nothing that can top it. You're all screwed. There's no one that can top this. This is beautiful. I love it. Are you looking for a darker pen and paper RPG that is the amalgamation of Mad Max meeting Berserk in a dark fantasy renaissance setting with a heavy sprinkling of the Book of Revelation of St. John mixed right on in? Then you're going to be looking for Apocalypse, John's Guide to the Armageddon by Acheron Games. In this beautiful homage to religious themes, you too can embark in a sandbox adventure using book one that will allow you to live in a world that is forever changing due to the biblical Armageddon. Finding unique items and artifacts such as the Ark of the Covenant, the Spear of Longinus, the Rod of Moses, and more. With book two, it's all about the monsters such as the Behemoth, the Mighty Leviathan, and the Cherubims. And of course, book three is a book of Revelation, the illustrated reprint of Revelation from the Bible in English, Latin, and Italian. Now, if you're interested in this dark fantasy world, feel free to check them out on their Kickstarter, link in the description below, which is available from the 15th of February to the 3rd of March. Happy hunting. The final fight in Curse of Strahd. It was the conclusion to an almost year-long campaign with several of my high school friends. Our characters had been through a lot together at that point, and it was also the final session before a couple of my friends in the group went off to college. So the fight took three or so hours by itself, but I would pay an arm and a leg to relive the moment where our party stepped out of Castle Ravenloft and saw the sunshine on Barovia for the first time in centuries. Well, tell us about the fight. How did it happen? What went down? I was DMing a completely homebrew world and campaign. I had, for lack of a better term, that guy in my game. Uh, uh. For the first five months of the campaign, the party was aligning with one of the three brothers in my campaign named Orion. Their whole goal was to make him strong enough so that he could fight his other two brothers, Shade, the oldest, and Blackheart, the youngest. One day, while searching for an artifact I called the Demon's Heart, my players discovered a man sitting on his knees inside a runic circle. That guy had a weapon that would break the spell being held by runic circles if he attacked the circle with it. Oh, without even questioning it, without any checks on what that spell was, he broke the seal that was holding a Calamity class being. Oh, there we go. This being was nicknamed the Father, as he was the birth father to the three brothers. He thanked them for releasing him and promptly left. Fast forward a few weeks, I had two players leave, including that guy, and I had two new players join. They got an urgent message from Orion's third general, the Nameless, and they left to join him on the battlefield. When they got there, they found Blackheart laying on the ground, decapitated, and Shade and Orion on their knees at their father's feet. My party struck down the father in about 15 rounds of combat, as he had literally just finished fighting three level 20 NPCs, and now had to fight another five level 18s. Oh, the fight was hard. Four of the five members went down. The last remaining player was a rogue, so he couldn't get them back up. But he landed the last hit, killing the father. When I described his death, the party erupted with cheers and happiness. Ah, one of my proudest moments as a DM. After killing and reviving a sleeping titan god with a magical fire extinguisher. <laughs> 
how in the hell we traveled to the lair of the big bad. His name was Xylix, and he was what we thought would be the modified beholder who had captured another very powerful god and was going to use her power to destroy the land. The party consisted of myself, a high elf ghost slayer blood hunter named Casadora de Sangre, also known as Hunter, a warforged artificer named Orum, a half elf homebrew necromancer named Verasam, a dragonborn wizard who I cannot remember the name of because he literally joined for the last two sessions, and our DMPC Echo Knight fighter named Seth. Thank you, Seth, for having the easiest pronounced name next to Orum. <laughs> After beating some of the mini-bosses and going through the lair to the final boss room, we found out that Mr. Beholder Guy was actually an amped-up death tyrant working with the daughter of the person who gave us the quest. Good luck with that one. Now, to preface the actual final blow, I had pulled the moon card from my deck of many things and had been granted three wishes. I had already used two of them, one to escape imminent death and then another to cleanse the entire tribe of orcs from an influence of a darker being. Verasam had summoned a bone claw who we dubbed Wa Wa Luigi. <laughs> I got scared reading that post fight. Whom had Xylix grappled? Our wizard was down, Orm was next, and I was basically one shot. But then I remembered that I could use Wish to cast spells. Now, I know the description says eighth level or lower, ya yeah, ya, yeah, but our DM didn't care about that and said I could do basically whatever I wanted with it. At the time, Waluigi was hanging on to Xylix, who was flying 65 feet in the air. I told Verisam to command him to try to pull Xylix down just a few feet. And with a contested strength roll, he did. 60 feet off the ground, so as soon as my turn came around, I decided, screw it, risk it all. We had been fighting for a very long time, and I had assumed he must be very low health as well. I ran directly below Xylix and looked at my DM and said, I would like to make my final wish. Well, what would you like to do? I cast Power Word Kill on Xylix. After a few moments of silence and shock from everyone, and probably the greatest and most nerve-wracking grin I've ever seen from the DM, he describes in detail as Hunter runs below the Death Tyrant and screams the word DIE in a banshee-like voice, which I clearly don't have because I'm a baritone, and Xylix's final screams echo throughout the chamber as he slowly falls to the ground dead. When I tell you tears of joy and celebration occurred, I am not joking with you in the slightest. I'll never forget that. I'll hold that memory dearly forever. I'm new to D&D. Two of my friends tried to get me into it for years and I finally told them yes. So since I was new, they set me up with a one shot and had me start out at level 10. I knew a little about D&D and I didn't want to play something generic for my first time, so I made an Aarakocra barbarian named Squake. My uh, wings were broken. My DM's plan was to have my character transport a noble from one location to another and have one of the party members sell us out to bandits and I would need to fight them at the end. Just before the fight with the bandits is supposed to take place, I go to a shop to see if I can buy any magic items or anything that could be useful. That's when my DM tells me, there is a dread helm for sale. Well, it's practically useless, but I have an idea I want to try. When it was time for the bandits to show up in the final boss of the one shot, I asked my DM if I can roll for performance. My character is actually from the circus. Well, the DM has no idea why I want to do that, but it allows it if I can both roll for it and perform it myself. I roll a 17 plus in my seven performance. We want the noble, hand him over and no one gets hurt. <laughs> Squake starts to laugh. <laughs> you must be very stupid if you think you can beat me with your little group. Ah, bullshit. There's only one of you. Do you really think that a noble would just hire some random circus performer to protect him? All that money on a nobody? <laughs> he did, but the bandits didn't know that. <laughs> the bandits are now looking at each other as I laugh more, not knowing if I was serious or not. Now, I'm going to be nice and let you walk away, <laughs> because if you don't, I put on the dread helm, which makes my eyes glow red and hides the rest of my face in shadow. I pull out my berserker hand axe and use storm soul to set the hand axe on fire. You are all going to fucking die. <laughs> 
<laughs> my DM was not expecting that and tried to roll for a comeback, but got a low roll. So I intimidated them into all running away, terrified. It wasn't until after the fight that my DM told me that some of the bandits were supposed to be the final boss of the one shot and he had no idea what to do now. All in all, it was a fun time. Yeah, and you just pulled something right out of your butt and made it something amazing. Wonderful. Not a final boss fight, but in our latest session, the big bad and a small group of underlings, though, all necromancers in some way, appear in the middle of the town where the shifter monk had trained before moving on to another monastery, offering entry into the Black and Spine group to study an art that the local law had forbade them to even think about. Halfway through the speech, a home-brewed enemy known as the Lich Specter, whom the party has faced two sessions prior, appears. The Big Bad and his underlings are scared and start to cast their teleportation spells and leave, realizing that things are clearly going downhill. The monk, however, grabs a hold of him by gripping his taloned fingers into his shoulder blades and said, You will face the consequences of your necromancy. Three turns later, the monk kills him, only to find out that it was a simulacrum. Suffice it to say, the monk was pissed. Hey everybody, Brian Von Vier checking in after the vid. Please make sure to leave a like, subscribe, and of course to ring that bell to get notified whenever we post a brand new video. And if you would like to contribute to this discussion, you can do so in the comments below. All the love, everybody.